Okay, gentlemen, uh, welcome to Tuesday night men's Bible study. Um, first, we'll I'm going to pray. There's a couple people possibly coming in. I'm just going to wait, but they can come in quietly while we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, the privilege of studying your word. I thank you for the opportunity to share your word and the privilege of doing that. Thank you for these men and the time they've set aside to study your word. We so appreciate and uh, are thankful for the fact that you preserved your word to us over so many centuries at the cost of so many lives down through history. We thank you for it being a light to our path, a lamp to our feet. We ask tonight that as we study Zechariah 6 that you impress on each of us something that we can apply to become more Christ-like. Thank you again for all of your goodness to us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Okay. So we're going to, as I mentioned in my prayer, we're going to be studying Zechariah chapter 6. Um, we're going to get a little bit of a running start. I, not, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I want to just remind you where it falls in biblical history because biblical history is redemptive history. Biblical history is the history of God as... The God of the nation of Israel instructing and encouraging them to a relationship with him that would result in Israel being the chosen nation, a nation of priests, so to speak. And the Old Testament is that obedience, disobedience cycle we continue to see. So I just call it redemptive history. This is just an overview of redemptive history in general of the Old Testament, starting all the way on the left, on your left from creation. <clears throat> through Moses, etc. We go and get over to the divided kingdom with all the kings and then the carrying the ways. And then Ezra and Nehemiah is when they come back from the captivity. So Zechariah, just to give you a time frame, is over to the right of this. Okay, it's over here. After this, after Ezra and Nehemiah, is only about 400 years, 400 a little plus years before all those gospel records we read when Jesus Christ is on the scene. He's born at something like depending on your chronology, 3 to 5 B.C. I'm sorry, yeah, by like B.C. And dies in about 30 A.D., something like that. So, Zechariah is one of the three prophets, which we'll see later, that prophesied after the, the return of the people to Jerusalem. So, general time frame, okay? Um, I don't know that we need to do this. This is the king's... And just shows the carrying away in 586. I don't know if we need to review that. Um, this gives you an idea. This is just a list of, the, of all the prophets and when they prophesied. And they're in chronological order, in the order that they actually said anything that's recorded in the Old Testament. You'll notice down here at the base, I hope you can see it, maybe not. Zechariah is the first one to begin prophesying after the return from Babylon. And he prophesies the years that they assigned to him is 522 to 509. So he's prophesying over a, what, 12 or 13-year period? And when he starts, um, you may remember, and we'll look at the specifics, the couple of verses that specify this in Ezra in a minute, but when they come back from Babylon and the edict from Cyrus says, rebuild the temple, they start to do that. And you may remember, um, actually turn to Ezra chapter 4. Ezra chapter 4. <clears throat> In your Bible of choice. So in Ezra chapter 4, um, they begin to build the temple. I think it is they lay the foundation. Yeah, in, in Ezra 3.10. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, you know, that's when they laid the foundation. But then we get to 4.1. Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity built the temple under the Lord God of Israel, then they came to Jerubbabel, etc., etc. Those were the people who lived in the area of Samaria, northern Israel. So they hear about the building of the temple. They obstruct that such that the people who are building the temple, the Jews who have returned are building the temple, they essentially stop doing so. And they stopped doing so until the second year of Darius, one of the kings of Persia. It's about a 15 year, 14 or 15 year period. They just stopped. Well, Zechariah is prophesying during that time. Okay? 
sort of toward the end of that time. In fact, you can see it in Ezra chapter No, uh, no, it's chapter 5 of Ezra. We're still in Ezra, so chapter 5. Then the prophets Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Iddo prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, even unto them. So at that point, Zechariah and Haggai, are, they, they did, if you look at years, Haggai was in 520, so they prophesied, they coincided for a time. <coughs> Although Zechariah was prophesying for a longer time. But the point is, and what I wanted to point out more specifically is, there was this hiatus, this um, resistance that they encountered, the people who were building the temple encountered from the Samaritans up north. Okay, So they just stopped. That's what Zechariah and Haggai, are. a lot of what they are prophesying about is that. We saw that in Haggai, but Zechariah is the same way. In any case, again, just wanted to set a little bit of historical background. Um, I don't think we need that so Zechariah was one of the three prophets after the return of the people to Israel. Um, Zechariah, Haggai, and Malachi. Malachi was the last one to prophesy before the 400 year period. That is, no prophecy at all until Jesus Christ is born. <coughs> Zechariah was the first prophet. And then, he, as we saw, he prophesied 522 to 509. 15, 16 year hiatus in the building of the temple, which started with the return of the people in 536. And then uh, we won't look at it specifically, but in, in Ezra 6.15, they finish the temple four years after they restart. So in the second year of Darius, they restart building. In the sixth year of Darius, they finish. So once they actually start, so, and you've got to think about that with respect to a 15-year hiatus. It could have been done four times. <laughs> but it wasn't until they restarted. They restarted and then four more years before they were finished. It could have been finished a lot sooner, but they allowed themselves to be... Uh, for the adversaries to, to win the day, essentially. They just stopped because of that. So let's, <coughs> uh, so again, just general overview so you understand time frame wise. Uh, Cyrus has decreed to rebuild the temple. These are, this is when the people are still over in Babylon in captivity, right? Cyrus, Persia takes over, you know, conquers Babylon. Cyrus, the king of Persia, remember he's prophesied of in Isaiah 4428 by name that he's going to do this. Right, so he gives the edict, 536, go back and build the temple, 539 actually, I think it was. They come back in 536, um, the foundation is laid as we looked at in Ezra 310, uh, the work then ceases, there's that 15 or 16 year hiatus, Zechariah begins prophesying in the second year of Darius when they re begin rebuilding, and then in the sixth year they finish, right? So that's the general lay of the land of what's happening here. So. Part of the reason I wanted to remind you of those things is it's, it is a commentary to some degree on the spiritual attitude of the people who returned from the captivity, that they were willing to live with a 15 to 16 year hiatus building the temple. That means they laid the foundation and those foundation stones for 15 or 16 years were a witness to them every time they walked by that they weren't doing it. And they were willing to live with that. That's part of the reason I wanted to point out the time frame here. As historical data, this historical data is not just historical data, it's people's lives. It's just like God works in your life to when you were saved to such and such an event, to such and such, it's the same thing. When we look at this, the children of Israel, um, children of Judah actually, when they came back and they started building, they laid a foundation and then they stopped. And it's not until 15 or 16 years later when they're prodded by Zechariah and Haggai that they start doing it again. And they're willing to live with that for those 15 or 16 years, until somebody calls them on the carpet. And again, you think of your own life, you know, I think of my life, I mean, how much, um, you'll, if you haven't learned already, you will soon learn as a Christian that you cannot peacefully coexist with the devil. That is not possible. Right? You can't have a little bit of sin over there and sort of let that, because that's essentially what the children of Judah, you know, that's what they were doing. They were, man, that's fun, that foundation looks really good. Man, that foundation looks really good. What are we going to do with that? For 15 or 16 years, they just peacefully coexisted with it being stopped. Okay. So, again, commentary on modern life. You know, is there is there some place in my life where, well, you know, Jesus is Lord over there, but I'm not sure about over there. I'm not I'm not so sure about that part. I'm going to hang on to that part. 
and we all have those things. Um, Christ being the Lord of our life, truly the boss, which is what the word Lord means. Uh, many times in the New Testament, the word kurios. By the way, the passage the other day that Pastor Kevin uh, talked from, there is, he brought out a great distinction in that passage because when he says, you know, launch out your boats, Jesus says to Peter, launch out your boats, cast your nets. Peter says, Master. And he calls him Master the first time. And it's a different Greek word. It's a, it's a, a stasis, I believe. I have to look that one up to be certain. But it's not the normal word for Lord or even for Sir in the New Testament is the Greek word kurios. Well, that's not the word he used the first time when he said, We have toiled all night long. We haven't gotten anything. But because you said it, I'll go. And he calls him Master in that verse. But the word he uses for master is not kurios. The second time when he gets the load of fish and the boats are full and he falls down and says, depart for me, I'm a sinner. Then he calls him kurios. Then he calls him Lord. So you can see the change in Peter's attitude toward Jesus from the way he addressed him the first time and the way he addressed him the second time. It's a great distinction. Uh, anyway, so let's actually read uh, Zechariah on... As, a, as the first six chapters. There are 14 chapters. We're not going to talk about 7 through 14 in terms of kind of general structure. But 1, 1 through 6, which we may actually read again, but 1, 1 through 6 is just an introduction. And then uh, chapter 1, verse 7 through a portion of chapter 6 that we're going to read tonight is eight visions that he sees based on what said, it says in the text all in one, at, at one time. You know, in one night, so to speak, or at one time. It's not like they are stretched out over time. Based on what it says, there would be no reason to think that it happened over a long time. It may have happened in one night that he had these visions. And then the last part of chapter 6 that we'll read is the crowning of Joshua the high priest, which, as we read it, you'll we'll, we'll also see that it's, it's prophecy of, of the Messiah, of what's going to actually happen when Jesus Christ is on the scene in victory, not as the suffering Messiah that we see in the Gospels but as the glorified Messiah when he comes back. <clears throat> so let's, uh, I think at this point, let's read Zechariah chapter 6, if we could. Okay. Now I'm going to be reading in the King James. Oh, I apologize for it, because some of these things are, they may read a little different. So, uh, in fact, if somebody else wants to read, that might be good. Anybody want to read? Uh, there are a total of, what, 15 verses? Anybody like reading? Don't or split it up if you like. Yeah, split it up if you like. Just read loud, Mr. Reagan, right here, please. Then I turned and raised my eyes and looked. And behold, four chariots were coming from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of bronze. With the first chariot were red horses. With the second chariot, black horses. With the third chariot, white horses. And with the fourth chariot, dappled horses, strong steeds. Then I answered and said to the angel who talked with me, What are these, my Lord? And the angel answered and said to me, These are four spirits of heaven who go out from their station before the Lord of all the earth. The one with the black horses is going to the north country, the white are going after them, and the dappled are going toward the south country. Then the strong steeds went out, eager to go, that they might walk to and fro throughout the earth. And he said, Go, walk to and fro throughout the earth. So they walked to and fro throughout the earth. And he called to me and spoke to me, saying, See those who go toward the north country have given rest to my spirit in the north country. Then <clears throat> the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Receive the gift from the captives, from Helmei, Tobijah, and Jediah, who have come from Babylon, and go the same day into the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. Take the silver and the gold, make an elaborate crown, and set it on the head of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Then speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch. From his place he shall branch out. He shall build the temple of the Lord, Yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule on his throne. So he shall be a high priest on his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. 
Now the eleventh crown shall be for a memorial in the temple for the Lord, for Helen, Tobijah, Jediah, and Ham, the son of Zephaniah. Even those from afar shall come and build the temple of the Lord. Then you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And this shall come to pass and diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. Okay, thank you. Thank you both. Um, so let's talk about the first part a little bit. And um, I, okay, so so Zechariah sees this vision, and his first question is, "What does this mean?" Right now, um, the angel then interprets the vision to him to the degree that the angel is going to interpret the vision and to the degree that he wants Zechariah to understand. Right? Just keep those things in mind for a moment. Let's look at, uh, let's look at, keep your finger here, we're going to come back here, of course, or, or your digital finger there. But look at Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. One of the things when you study God's Word, which I'm sure you all do, one of these things, one of the things when you study God's word is um, not only allowing God's word to define its own terms. That is to say, if you're looking up a particular word, for example, you look at other places where that word occurs to determine the meaning. We do the same thing in English all the time. If you encounter a word that someone says that you don't know, you try to figure out from context what that word means. Of course you do. Or if you read, if I read. You know, I can't read blueprints, right? I can read Greek, but I can't read blueprints. So if I'm looking at a blueprint, I'm going to look at that symbol and think, well, now, that means that, and that means that. What might that mean? We do the same thing in English that you would do when you're studying God's Word. The other thing you can do is look for um, cross-references, other places where a similar biblical situation occurs. Revelation chapter 7. Let's just read... Uh, from a couple of verses, starting in verse 1. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree, etc., etc. And there's a little bit more about that in Revelation chapter 9. Now, the only reason I point that out, and I mention the fact that the first thing Zechariah does is ask what it means, which we would do when we read it as well. And point out the fact that the angel explains what he wants to understand <coughs> is that, in my opinion, this is my opinion, Christianity in general gets absolutely carried away with the meaning of visions. They get and they totally, they totally miss the purpose of the vision. I mean, the purpose, and you can study visions on your own. There are many, many visions. We'll look at a couple. But the purpose of a vision, if you think about and studying various visions is typically either hope, building hope, or instruction, one of the two. Right? We'll look at a couple that are more instructional, one that's, one that's actually more building hope. The point is, the specific meaning of this vision, the angel explained only to a degree, and apparently only to the degree that Zechariah either needed to understand or he wanted to understand. And it behooves us then, in that case, to not take it any further than that. If the Bible doesn't tell us what it means, we don't know. The parables are the same way. There are only a couple of parables when Jesus Christ actually explains, okay, this is what this means. And wisely, as bad a rap as the disciples many times get for things they did, wisely, they came to Jesus after the parable of the sower, he explains all this stuff, and they come and say, what are you talking about? Okay. If you don't understand this parable, you're not going to understand any parable. Here's the deal. You know, the seed is the word of God. Da, 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 da. And he explains it to them. So they understand that. Other parables, he doesn't necessarily do that. So we can't, in that case, when God's word is not explicit as to meaning, yet caught up with meaning, rather to pay attention to the purpose of the vision, as we can see, well, actually, let me, let's, let me just show you one thing. So I think it's great. Um, I use a study Bible. It's called the Companion Bible. And um, it's got different study notes in the margins. So on these couple of verses relative to Zechariah uh, 6, 1-7, he notes um, 
that, and these are just quotes from this fellow. This fellow's name was Bowling. Anyway, he says, this is the angel's interpretation and needs no further explanation. It is for our faith, not for our reason. <laughs> How many times, and, and I truly think this is the case, uh, for example, relative to the book of Revelation. How many people have you seen write books, do videos, hold seminars on the events of the book of Revelation coming to pass at a certain, I, I don't know if you were here, but one night I taught, I handed out a list of how many dates there have been since about 500 AD when people flat out said Jesus was coming back on this date. There have been innumerable times. And what does it do? Totally distract people from Christian living. Totally distracts them. I mean, even at the point that they sell their property, just ridiculous stuff. But it totally distracts them. Because we get occupied, we get preoccupied with the meaning of the vision. What does this mean, this mean, this mean, this mean? Instead of the overall purpose of the vision, either hope or instruction. So the purpose of this vision, remember, Zechariah is prophesying to a bunch of apathetic people. They were willing to walk by the foundation of the temple for 15 years. And that's okay. I'm good with that. Until they hear from Hannah and Zechariah. What are you doing? You build, you build your own houses? You won't build a temple? You got to think about, and I don't know, I'm not trying to inject myself into it, but you have to think about the tone of voice of these guys and the expression on their face. How did they get 30, 40,000 people that came back from Babylon to actually do something? Right? After they hadn't done it for 15 years. So you got to think about the tone of voice and just moxie. Just get in there and I don't know whether you want to hear it or not. You're going to hear it. So it's, they were just men of steel. Uh, the other note that he had in the text here, this companion Bible, um, he's talking about the angels now, right? They thus have to do, and, and he actually, uh, I got the Revelation 7 um, reference, cross reference from here and from another uh, work that I use called the Treasure of Scripture Knowledge, which is an outstanding little. It's just a list of cross-references, but it's just fabulous. In any case, he says regarding that and the fact that those four angels appear in Revelation 7, just like they appear here, he says, they thus, the angels, thus have to do with the time of the end. Their, their ministry is earthward and has to do with judgment. That's all he says about it, because that's all we know. He says, go walk to and fro the earth, and they did it. That's all we know, because that's all the angel explained. We don't know any more than that. And I just encourage you, um, let's look at, uh, yeah, let's, let's look at, um, actually, I'll just read this, Habakkuk, Habakkuk, actually, I think it is, uh, chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. These are great verses for a couple of principles. One is with respect to visions. The other is, if you ever get an opportunity to share God's word, the, it, this has a great principle in it about the way in which you should share it. Anyway, the Amplified Bible, I'll use different translations here. Because the KJV, I will never admit it to DA, but the KJV is a little clumsy here. <laughs> so, verse uh, 2 of Habakkuk 2. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and engrave it so plainly upon tablets that everyone who passes may be able to read it easily and quickly as he passes by. Now, that is the great principle of teaching. It shouldn't be so complicated that somebody can't hear it and really understand it at, at one pass, so to speak. In the King James, it says that he may run that readeth it. And what it really means is, as you're running by, if he sees that, he can understand it. That's really what the Hebrew means. So that's a great principle if you get to share God's Word with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, or you have an opportunity to share God's Word in a, in a setting. It should not be complicated. People should be able to understand it. If I don't understand something well enough to communicate it fairly quickly and clearly, then I don't really understand it. Um, and then the next verse, it's actually verse 3, but this is Young's literal translation. It's not like Robert Young did a literal translation of the Old Testament, uh, the Hebrew. He says, for, and this is verse 3, For yet the vision is for a season, and it breathes, which is, I think, a great translation, but it, he means it, it, in the sense of exists. That is, it was spoken, and it, it exists for this purpose. You know, breathes for the end, and does not lie. If it tarry, wait for it, for surely it comes. It is not late. Okay? We see a vision like this, and we think, 
the difference that man, you know, Peter talks about that. Um, he says, you know, things were the same as always. Jesus didn't come back. Or, but the visions we see, for example, you know, the entire book of Revelation, essentially the vision, it's going to happen. I don't care if it's been 2,000 years since it was spoken. That doesn't make any difference. It's going to happen. It exists. It was spoken for that reason. It, God's word does not ever return void. It is going to happen, whether you think it is or not. But don't get preoccupied with particulars of meaning. Rather, the, the purpose of it, overall I'm talking about, and these are my opinions, I mean, these are my opinions. The purpose of it is to give us hope for the end because we know what it looks like at the end. We know there is a final victory. When we don't have to put up with the baloney that the devil throws at us all the time because there won't be a devil. He's going to be gone, right? That's the real purpose. Yeah, there's a lot of particulars. Do we understand those? No, we don't. Any more than the angel explains it to Zechariah in, Ze in Zechariah chapter 6. No, we don't. But that's beside the point. <laughs> the point is, it's supposed to encourage Christian living. Um, vision in general. And now I'm making a little bit of a transition between the vision that the Lord would give someone. Actually, before I do that, let's look at, let's look at Acts chapter 10. Look at Acts chapter 10. Look at a couple of examples of visions. Again, this is all related to Zechariah 6. Um, and Acts chapter 10, Peter actually has a vision. And we'll start in Acts chapter 10. Yeah. In, uh, and we'll start in verse 10. So he goes up about the sixth hour, verse nine. He goes up, so he goes up about about noon, right? Yeah, about noon, I believe. I think that's right. In any case, so he goes up a little lunchtime. He's hungry. He became very hungry. Verse ten. Have eaten? Would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance or a vision, and saw a heaven opened, and a certain vessel descending unto him, as had been a great sheet knit at the four corners, let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, fowls of the air. Came a voice from him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. But the voice spake unto him the second time, What God has cleansed, that call not, call not thou common. That was done three times. Apparently, the Lord felt Peter needed to see this a few times before he would understand. Because God doesn't do things by accident. Right? He sees three times this happens. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. I've never eaten anything common or unclean. That which God has cleansed, call not thou common. Again. Again. Right? And then at the end, which I think is great. This is on thrice. Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision would he had seen would mean. Right? So he saw this stuff and he's thinking, what does that mean? So God directs him to other things. And then if you look at later in uh, chapter 10, a verse, uh, let's see. Uh, 34. He comes to a perception of the vision, of the, of the vision that he had, as well as you know, the, the actions following that, what God told him to do. You get up and you go to job. Anyway, in uh, verse 34, then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Right? So there's a vision that's informational. You may remember even when Jesus was still on the earth, he talked about the fact that the Gentiles we're going to be blessed through his ministry. Peter never heard that. This incident is uh, something like AD 40, maybe 10, between 10 and 15 years after the crucifixion and resurrection. So it was a while and took vision three times, informational vision, before Peter got that. Now let's look, so that's an informational vision. Let's look at Acts 18, where Paul actually has a vision, and it's a very, it's just truly two verses. Let's see. I apologize if I didn't write like a verse. Or maybe I did. No, I didn't. Oh, yes, it is not. Uh, then, 
spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. Now, we can determine it, a couple of things from that, from just reading that. Number one, would you conclude that Paul was afraid? Why? Why would you conclude that? Because God told him not to be. So, he was, right? Now we're talking about the Apostle Paul, the guy that not only was willing to, but did, in fact, risk his life many times for the gospel. He's afraid. So this vision is to encourage him, right? And God tells him something that he couldn't possibly know. I have much people in this city. He couldn't possibly know that. But it was encouragement. There is a hope there of, you're going to do fine speaking God's word. I have much people here. Right? So God encourages him, gives him a hope. So that um, the thing I thought about with visions in general, and even things like the visions that we read about, I mean, we didn't experience this vision, but when we read about the visions of, of heaven, of a new heaven and a new earth, of um, no more sin, sickness, death, no more tears, no more crying for the former things have passed away. When we read those visions and actually believe them, it, it lifts our everyday activities from menial to eternal. I mean, because we're living for something that we see there that is going to be just fabulous. It makes the servant's duties, like it talks about in Colossians 3, 23 and 24, you know, servants obey your masters. And then it says, for you know you receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. So the menial task of a servant becomes of eternal, eternal importance because you serve the Lord Christ, you're going to receive the reward of the inheritance. So vision raises our little everyday, put one foot in front of the other kind of things to eternal significance. And that's why a vision that we read about in Zechariah 6 is significant. It talks about what's going to happen in the end times. But our understanding of particulars might not be there unless the Bible specifically tells us that. But we can't get preoccupied with that. The reason I'm belaboring this a little is that I think this is, I think Christianity shoots themselves in the foot with this all the time. They get preoccupied with end days and these days and that days and all we gotta do, it, let's say that Jesus comes back tomorrow, right? Or let's say that it's another 2,000 years. Does it change what you're supposed to do? No, it doesn't change. It doesn't change reading the Bible. It doesn't change teaching your kids. It doesn't change loving your wife. It doesn't change being a leader in the church. Or any, it doesn't change anything. In fact, if anything, if it's 2,000 years away, you're going to be more diligent because you can, you can store up more rewards, for heaven's sake. So I think we get very preoccupied with it, and I think that's not good. I think it's spiritually unhealthy. But I think that, I mean, I'm going to be stark, just candid, and say that I think Christian authors, televangelists, Radio preachers, um, not all of them, I'm not saying that, but I think there are those that simply exploit people's thirst for wanting to know what this vision or that vision means or is. When what they should be preoccupied with is reading God's Word, witnessing God's Word, financial giving, going to church, helping somebody out. That's what they should be pre Instead of reading Revelation 7 and trying to figure out what those four angels are. What do those black horses mean? Why are those horses red? If the angel didn't tell you that, then you don't know and you never will. <laughs> so, now the rest of the chapter. Uh, let's, let's go back to Zechariah 6 and we have to read the rest of chapter 6. Just going to blaze through it. So, Zechariah 6, and we'll start in uh, verse 9. The word of the Lord came unto me. Actually, we won't read the whole thing again. This is where he makes crowns, then he crowns um, Joshua, the son of Josedek, as high priest. And then, about in verse uh, in verse 12, but in, in verse 12 it is, but even more in 13, you see that this um, has a future fulfillment as a prophecy in Messiah. Right? Because there are things spoken here that aren't going to be fulfilled by the average human high priest. They're not. Now, the only thing I want to point out, a couple of things about this prophecy. One is that there was a present fulfillment 
I mean, they actually did make those crowns. They actually did crown him. He actually did oversee the building of the temple. All those things actually happened. There was a fulfillment at that time. But there is also a future fulfillment. So this prophecy can be, is, is going to be, this, this that was spoken is going to be sort of fulfilled twice. Because it is going to be fulfilled in the future with Messiah. You know, there is going to be a rebuilding of the temple. The Messiah is coming back. All those things are actually going to happen. Um, and the other thing I wanted to point out to you, though, is that uh, in verse 15, And they that are a father of the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you, and this shall come to pass, if you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. Now, I just wanted to look at that you know, last verse. So if you read that verse, in whatever translation you read, okay, so, so we know the will of God, we know, we know what the prophecy talks about, building the temple, overseeing the temple, you know, there's going to be future events that it talks about, so that's what the prophecy talks about, right? And then we see that last verse, and that last verse, what does it say about the coming to pass of the will of God that's spoken of in those previous two verses? What does that last verse say about God's will coming to pass? If. Yes, yes. And what is then God's will coming to pass predicated on? Our obedience. Right. It's Our predicated obedience. on obedience. Now, I just want you to think about something for a moment, and that is, think about the fact that, okay, so we have, <laughs> we have God Almighty here, Elohim, that in Genesis 1, speaks everything that you see into being in six days. And he speaks it into being. It's not like he had to build it or put it together or anything like that. He spoke it into being. Let the earth bring forth. Let the waters gather. His word brought these things to pass in six days. So wouldn't it be safe to assume, would you agree with me, that God can do whatever he wants to, whenever he wants to do it. Right? Because he's God. He can do whatever he wants to, whenever he wants to do it. By the way, one of the things he spoke into being was you and me in one day. Right? Think about, another thing I think about is, like I've mentioned before in my sharing God's word up here, talking about renewed mind and that sort of thing, that the human brain is pretty commonly recognized among even profane, you know, not, not Christian scientists, but unchristian scientists. It is pretty commonly recognized as the most complicated thing in the universe, right? Pretty, pretty much, I mean, we're talking like 10 trillion cells, and one cell has 10 trillion connections to other cells. It's just ridiculous. The point is, have you thought about how much bigger God has to be than that to speak that into being in one day? How much more complicated and exalted and powerful he's got to be for him to be able to do that. He's just, oh my gosh, we can't possibly conceive of how powerful this God is. We can't possibly do it. Even with the magnificent brain he gave us, we can't do it. So you got this unbelievably powerful God. He speaks his will in these verses. And then what does he predicate that will coming to pass on? Whether you and I obey or not. Now here's a kicker. Sort of. You can think about this. I'm not going to say this is kind of chapter and verse. but So there were two fulfillments for this prophecy, as I mentioned. There was a building of the temple then, of course, and there's going to be a, a prophetic temple. I mean, there's going to be a, an Ezekiel temple. Like it's talked about in Ezekiel 40 through 48. There's going to be a, a Messiah coming back. That's going to happen. Right? So there's going to be a future fulfillment. So when you get to verse... Uh, the last part of verse 15, if you will diligently obey, and this shall come to pass, if you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. So they built the temple then, but they held off for a while. You know, they waited. But what's that, what does it say about Israel as a nation? Because this is talking to Israel. When, if, if when Messiah came, if Israel had as a nation acknowledged Jesus Christ the Messiah, what do you think that would have been? Now that's a hypothetical. That's a hypothetical. That's not chapter and verse. But if they had actually done the second part of verse 15, if you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, if they had actually 
acknowledge Jesus Christ as Savior, acknowledge it as the suffering Savior, He was the coming King, I'm not sure it would have been very long before He came back again after His ascension because they would have nationally repented. They would have nationally done what God wanted them to do. You know, neither is it us, Acts 4, 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven among, given among men whereby we must be saved. If they had actually believed that, Anyway, I think about that. And that's just a, there's no chapter and verse on that. I just, it's amazing to me that God's will, as he speaks it here, or in many other places. I mean, you can read this for chapters in Deuteronomy 28 through 30. Um, there's a great verse in Deuteronomy 30, if you want to go there. Deuteronomy chapter 30, I believe it's. Yeah. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. I call, and this is, if you want to get a running start on this, I really encourage you to read from 28 on, up to 30, up through 30, 28, 29, and 30. Because after everything Moses tells them in the law, and reminds them of what God did for them, the miraculous wilderness experience, etc., 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 and then he tells them in 28, 29, and 30, okay, if you may, this is going to happen, but if you don't, this is going to happen. And then the climax is in chapter 30, verse 19. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. So he just starkly sets before them, okay, this is what's going to happen if you obey, this is what's going to happen if you don't. Now, what was God's will for them to obey, to prosper them? What was it predicated on? Whether they chose to obey. In how many ways in our lives is God's will simply predicated on, are we willing to obey? Are we willing to obey? Are we willing to read God's word and actually do it? Because we see in God's word many times, God's will coming to pass is predicated on what a human being does. So I really encourage you in your individual Christian lives to, you know, to, to consider that and remember that God's will in your life is predicated on your obedience just like Israel as a nation and their, um, their future was predicated on their own obedience, according to Deuteronomy 30, 19 and 20. Um, and I think that's all I have to share about Zechariah 6. Um, I'll close with prayer and then we can have comments or questions or whatever. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much once again for your word. I thank you again for these men and their willingness to volunteer their time to learn about the work. Hopefully that was the case. Uh, we uh, help, uh, please imprint on our brains something from Zechariah 6 and from what your word said tonight that we can take and apply and become more Christ-like and our everyday lives. I thank you again for the privilege of sharing your word. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.